drama, spectatorship, and everyday life. If we seek a definition of drama in the Oxford English Dictionary, we find a surprisingly narrow, flattened, and yet somewhat revelatory description. This will improve your chances of having a snooze. Um, <laughs> A composition in prose or verse adapted to be acted upon a stage in which a story is related by means of dialogue and action and is represented with accompanying gesture, costume, and scenery as if in real life, as in real life, a play. So to be acted here assumes that actors exist to do the acting, and the definition claims that these individuals will act with accompanying gesture, costume, and scenery. So we have a performance which includes staging conventions at whatever level. The inclusion here of as in real life raises some interesting questions, but it seems to point to the physical temporal experiences and the mimetic qualities of drama. What is elided in this definition of drama is the fact that a performance requires onlookers, spectators, audience members, overhearers, playgoers, however you want to call them. Those individuals are somehow divided from those individuals who are presenting the drama. And if those individuals are not present as audience members or spectators, the performance is not a performance, but is instead a rehearsal. It is worth noting here that spectators and audience members, or audience, the two words we most commonly use to describe those individuals attending the presentation of drama, emphasize different aspects of the experience we are having. Spectator emphasizes the visual, from the Latin spectare, meaning to look, the root from which we derive spectacles for eyeglasses. And audience emphasizes the oral, from the Latin audientia, uh, meaning the act of listening, attention, or body of listeners. And we can easily think of other words <clears throat> that have a connected root, auditory or audible. I've tried to attend to the differences implied by the choice of word in this discussion of drama. Drama is a word that never appears in Shakespeare. Um, the term in use at the time was theater, a term that had only in Shakespeare's lifetime been firmly grasped by the live dramatic entertainment industry. Interestingly, theater in 1570 was used as a book title for the first of what we would now call an atlas. A which uh, is to say a collection of uniform map sheets and the sustaining text that goes with them bound together to form a codex book. Abraham Ortelius, a Flemish scholar, geographer, and illustrator named his printed collection of maps Teatrum Orbis Terrarum. His title page illustrates the links between spaces framed for viewing performances and then the five continents um, that he includes in his book are allegorically represented on the title page. Teatrum um, comes from the ancient Greek noun, teatron, a place for viewing, and from the uh, related verb, teome, to see, to watch, or to observe. And this etymology makes sense of why a collection of maps might be considered a teatrum. But it's still slightly surprising that it didn't catch on as a print collection term, and instead we have atlas. And then other collections still carry the terms connected to their contents, like chronicles or annals. Theater, though, in Shakespeare's period, becomes a word close to the definition offered by the OED. Dramatic performance, dramatic performances as a branch of art or as an institution, the drama, also the drama of a particular time or place, dramatic art as a craft, uh, the theatrical profession. And we know that part of drama being performed in a theater assumes the existence of spectators or audience members. Additionally, all drama creates, I think, its own internally nested set of spectators. The genre cannot exist fully without spectators, and as a genre, it always contains some of that necessity within its own structures. Or to put it another way, drama as a form depends so heavily on spectatorship that individual dramas utilize the possibilities of internal spectators. Some examples from William Shakespeare's Hamlet will illustrate what I mean here. <clears throat> the play within a play in Hamlet is an obvious example. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. 
Additionally, the arrival of the players at Elsinore and their wonderful recitation of the description of Hecuba and Hamlet's instructions to the players offer examples of what scholars have often termed metatheatrical moments in the play. Metatheatricality is often noted as those elements in some plays which make them theater about theater or dramas aware of themselves as drama. But this descriptive word is usually applied to plays within plays or entire dramatic structures that question the separation between mimetic representation and reality itself. So we could think of something like Luigi Pirandello's 1921, Six Characters in Search of an Author, for example. Some plays depend on and reference the amount of time that will pass in the playing of the events on stage as a way to immerse the audience in the temporal frames of the drama. In Eugene Inesco's 1962 Exit the King, the king has been informed of a mortal illness. He refuses to believe the news. His first wife, Queen Marguerite, tells the king with frightening precision, you are going to die in an hour and a half. You are going to die at the end of this performance, this show. <clears throat> Berenger, the king, refuses to believe her. That's not funny. But she repeats, um, <clears throat> you are going to die at the end of the show. In the theater, this dying is always the not dying death of theater, the death that allows the actor to come out for the curtain call despite the character's death. Yet in this play, the reference to the passage of time in the theater, a time frame that in this instance functions the same for spectators and the characters, serves to jolt the spectators into the action of the play. We might move away from these obvious versions of metatheatricality to think more broadly about the ways plays comment on or utilize the structures of genre. Again, some examples from Hamlet will illustrate these more deeply embedded structures of internally nested spectators. Hamlet is a play that depends heavily on surveillance, observation, overseeing, and overhearing. In 2.2, Polonius and Claudius strive to overhear a conversation they have staged between Ophelia and Hamlet. In 3-4, Polonius is hidden to overhear when Hamlet stabs him through the arras. The play, Hamlet, also depends on play acting by the characters, the acting of roles, most noticeably Hamlet putting on an antic disposition. But in more subtle ways, the play depends on characters acting roles. Hamlet instructs Horatio and Marcellus in 1-5 about their response to him. But come here, as before, never, so help you mercy, how strange or odd somever I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at such time seeing me never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as, well, we know, or we could and if we would, or if we list to speak, or, there be, and if they might, or such ambiguous giving out, to know that you know aught of me. This do swear, so grace and mercy at your most need help you. Not only then is he telling them how not to physically respond, but he's also telling them what lines not to say. In an instance of Hamlet offering instructions on how one ought to behave, he urges his mother to modify her behavior with Claudius. Good night, but go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue, if you have it not. Hamlet continues, that monster custom, who all sense doth eat of habits evil, is angel yet in this, that to the use of actions fair and good, he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on. Practice, rehearse, he says to Gertrude, and then perform for believability. And the attained believability will then increase with each performance. Refrain tonight, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy. For use almost can change the stamp of nature, and either lodge the devil or throw him out with wondrous potency. Hamlet is not the only character who plots ways of presenting performances in the play. Claudius, plotting with Laertes to fix in advance the outcome of the sword play between Laertes and Hamlet, says to Laertes, his co-conspirator, Let's further think of this, weigh what convenience both of time and means may fit to our shape. 
there's a physicality there to how time and means may fit us to our shape, a performative aspect. If this should fail and that our drift look through our bad performance, were better not essayed. Claudius here means by bad performance something like evil actions, but the use of the word performance is telling since they are plotting out the scene in advance. Dr. Clark's lecture two weeks ago reminded us of all the implications of essaying with its reverberations of trying and attempting. So now we can return to a definition of drama. <clears throat> and I propose that drama is, in terms of literature, a text meant to lead to or evoke a staged event prearranged by actors for presentation in a communal setting with a set of individuals designated as the spectators or audience members. And I've included evoke here for the instances of readerly imaginations, imaginings of possible stagings of plays. Additionally, as a genre, it contains similar experiences within the text for the characters as it does for those of us who consume it as spectators or audience members. This is to say that plays are always about plays, and this is a generic difference, that plays are always about plays in ways that novels are not always about novels or that poems are not always about poems. Obviously, there are many examples of novels about novels, from Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy to Michael Chabon's Wonder Boys, and many examples of poems about poems, Sir Philip Sidney's opening sonnet in Astrophil and Stella, or arguably William Butler Yeats' The Circus Animal's Desertion. Likewise, there are many examples in genre other than drama that similarly establish visually dependent viewers within the frameworks of a narrative. For example, Browning's My Last Duchess, often called a dramatic monologue for its direct address by a narrator in a controlled time with an implied hearer, and was published in the volume Dramatic Lyrics. The poem begins, that's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece of wonder now. The speaker in the poem interjects commentary to the hearer. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. Thus including the embedded stage direction to the hearer to rise. And eventually the speaker in the poem says, nay, we'll go together down, sir. T.S. Eliot's Coriolan Triumphal March establishes a group of spectators to watch the march. It is a poem determined to present the reader with the experience of the march, the parade, as if the reader were in the crowded audience. Stone, bronze, stone, steel, stone, oak leaves, horses, heels, over the paving, and the flags, and the trumpets, and so many eagles. How many? Count them, and such oppressive people. We hardly knew ourselves that day, or knew the city. This is the way to the temple, and we so many crowding the way. Or we can step back to John Milton's 1674 Paradise Lost, a poem ripe with theatrical aspects, but which establishes a similarly internally nested set of spectators watching a dramatic presentation when Michael, in Book 11, takes Adam and Eve to the perfect vantage point. It was a hill of paradise the highest, from whose top the hemisphere of earth in clearest ken stretched out to the amplest reach of prospect lay. A perfect vantage point, a perfect place to be a spectator. And Michael forces Adam and Eve to watch the parade of humankind, beginning with Cain and Abel. These are all examples of other genre using elements of drama, in particular the staging of events and actions for the experience of internal or implied spectators or audience members. It's also easy to think of examples of texts that develop drama as a form within another genre. In Virginia Woolf's Between the Acts, the novel explicitly emphasizes the role of the audience at the pageant. Not only do they have their roles as audience members, our part, said Bartholomew, is to be the audience, and a very important part, too. But they also play their roles in the 1939 society in which they find themselves. The description of the audience coming together makes a point of delineating the roles that the community members fulfill. The audience was assembling. They came streaming along the paths and spreading across the lawn. Some were old, some in the prime of life. There were children among them. Among them, as Mr. Figgis might have observed, were representatives of our most respected families. Roughly speaking, I'm eliding some, However, had Figgis been there in person and called a roll call, half the ladies and gentlemen present would have said, as some, I am here in place of my grandfather or great-grandfather, as the case might be. 
Wolf's novel catches the expectancy of the audience and the active work done by an audience to figure out what the dramatic presentation might mean. What luck, Mrs. Carter was saying, last year, then the play began. Was it or was it not the play? Some sat down hastily, others stopped talking guiltily. While they looked apprehensively and some finished their sentences, a small girl, like a rosebud in pink, advanced took her stand on a mat behind a conch held with, hung with leaves and piped, gentles and simples, I address you all. So it was the play then, or was it the prologue? Come hither for our festival, she continued. This is a pageant all may see, drawn from our island history. England am I, she's England, they whispered. <laughs> it's begun, the prologue, they added, looking down at the program. England am I, she piped again and stopped. She'd forgotten her lines. Here, here, said an old man in a white waistcoat briskly. Bravo, bravo. Oops. The novel uses the performed pageant to delineate the temporal frame of the entire series of events that appear in the novel. More importantly, the dramatic presentation supports and constructs much of the novel's insistence on the importance of roles. Roles in society, roles in private life, and the difficulties of identifying, adapting to, and maintaining those roles. Another example of a novel that adopts the dramatic form is James Joyce's 1922 Ulysses in the Circe episode, which would be worth reading for the stage directions alone. The famished snaggle tusks of an elderly bawd protrude from a doorway. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the camel, lifting a foreleg, plucks from a tree a large mango fruit, offers it to his mistress, blinking, in his cloven hoof, then drops, droops his head and grunting with uplifted neck, fumbles to kneel. Bloom stoops his back for leapfrog. <clears throat> In Jim Kutze's 1999 novel, Disgrace, Lucy, the distressed grown daughter, objects to her father's interference by saying, you behave as if everything I do is part of the story of your life. You are the main character. I'm a minor character who doesn't make an appearance until halfway through. Her father, David, has been attempting, in the course of the novel, uh, to write a drama of Byron's later years, and it is a novel consumed with notions of the roles people play in one another's lives. These are all literary works that depend on the understanding of drama as a genre to propel their own narratives in other genre. They rely on the generic conventions of drama while not giving us drama. Joyce, for example, in those stage directions is having fun with writing stage directions in the midst of a dramatically realized section of the novel. However, it never becomes theater. And while large swaths of the text of the pageant are offered in between the acts, it does not become a play. When playgoing was a greater proportion of public entertainment, the metaphorical descriptions of life as theater were more explicit. In William Shakespeare's 1599, As You Like It, the usurped Duke says after the arrival of the undermined, exiled, and famished Orlando, he says this to another character, um, Jakes, who's standing on stage. Thou seest we are not alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play. Wherein we play in, sorry. <clears throat> Jakes responds, and this you will undoubtedly recognize, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Or plays, they're not players. They are players, that's a misprint. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. In another well-known instance of the use of metaphor of life as theater, Macbeth, after being given the news of his wife's death, says, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Literature attempts to show us something about life. Drama insists that life can be better understood through drama's metaphors. In everyday life, theatrical metaphors have been sidelined. Is that a theatrical metaphor? Have they been upstaged by other metaphors? That is a theatrical metaphor. In some places, theater metaphors are still alive in our culture. Sadly, many of our dramatic expressions in frequent current use have to do with war, theaters of battle, scenes of action. But there are less ominous examples. We may still be employing a theatrical metaphor when we use a list of students at the beginning of the semester and do a roll call. The roll is a piece of parchment or paper which is written upon or intended to contain writing, music, etc., and is rolled up for ease of handling, carrying, or storing. A scroll. The manuscript parts 
the roles of text handed to the actors are often credited with bringing the word role from the same French root into common use in English as we have it now. And role-playing games are, of course, more popular than ever. We still say that someone or something played a part in an event, and we are comfortable with the expression waiting in the wings, which clearly depends on the offstage spaces of a theater stage for its resonance. One current use of the word drama, which seems to have escaped the word hounds at the OED, possibly because it seems to be a particularly American usage, is drama as something to be avoided. <clears throat> I found out from the titles of self-help books that there are ways to, and this is the title of a book by a reality television show star, there are ways to, quote, control the crazy, my plan to stop stressing, avoid drama, and maintain inner cool. <laughs> Additionally, one can hire a clinical hypnotherapist who claims he can help us avoid being a drama magnet. I found that out with Google. Um, <clears throat> Discover, he says on his web advertisement, why you might be always attracting unnecessary drama into your life and learn ways to minimize and better handle the effects. There are several interesting things about these uses of drama, and the OED has caught up enough to include, in 2006, a draft edition entry for Drama Queen. The OED offers this definition, a person who overreacts to a minor setback or who is prone to exaggeratedly dramatic behavior, also a person who thrives on being the center of attention. Drama is bad. <clears throat> I think the rejection of drama in these instances has to do with our discomfort in everyday life when, outside of a theatrical context, a person insists, demands, that one act as audience or spectator for that person. We are comfortable being audience members or spectators, but likely we prefer to have agreed to be a spectator rather than being pressed into that role. But to return to the proposed definition of drama that I've offered, drama is, in terms of literature, a text meant to lead to or evoke a staged event prearranged by actors for presentation in a communal setting with a set of individuals designated as the spectators or audience members. So what happens to us when we attend the theater or attend to theater, pay attention to it? What are we doing? What is our important role as the audience, that important role as Bartholomew puts it in between the acts? Physically, we are present. And as spectators or audience members, we are bound by the temporal unfolding of the drama. We can't tell how long something will continue in a drama. We are forced always to be simultaneously waiting and doing, experiencing that which we see and hear in the moment and expecting that it will continue on in the next. In a novel, a quick glance down the page shows how long a character speaks. The experience of the novel as a whole, at least when reading a codex book, is discernible by how many pages remain in our right hand. In the theater, we don't know how long a character will continue speaking, nor do we know how long physical actions will continue. This dependence on presentation means that experiencing in the theater is an action for the playgoers. It is a doing. This temporal limbo, a primary experience of theater, is one capitalized on by Samuel Beckett's 1954 play, Waiting for Godot. We can see how this suspension functions in almost any scene from the play. But, <coughs> but this particular scene offers some other resonances that I'll pick up after we see how this scene works. There's nothing to do. You go and stand there. He draws Vladimir to extreme right and places him with his back to the stage. There, don't move and watch out. Vladimir scans the horizon, screening his eyes with his hand. Estragon runs and takes up the same position extreme left. They turn their heads and look at each other. Back to back like in the good old days. They continue to look at each other for a moment, then resume their watch. Long silence. Do you see anything coming? What? Do you see anything coming? No. Nor I. 
They resume their watch. Silence. You must have had a vision. What? You must have had a vision. No need to shout. They resume their watch. Silence. Then turning simultaneously, do you? Oh, pardon. Carry on. No, no, after you. No, no, you first. I interrupted you. On the contrary. They glare at each other angrily. <clears throat> the two men set a watch, which is, after all, exactly what they are doing. And the expectation is for us that something will happen. And it does happen. They watch. Vladimir tries to suggest that Estragon has had a vision. They end the silence by both speaking at once and then argue about how they will continue their conversation. Things happen and not the thing they await happens. As audience members, we're actively engaged in their expectation. They're watching and our own expectation, our watching. Theater, as Paul Woodruff has described, is about watching and being watched. We have other examples of men on watch, waiting, and finding a way to pass the time. In this particular instance, from the opening scene of Hamlet, the waiting is interrupted. Hola, Barnardo. Say what, is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What, has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says, "'Tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it." Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story, what we have tonight seen which is to say, we'll pass the time um, waiting here by telling a story. Well, sit we down, and let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one, notice that in this speech of Bernardo's, the waiting and the expectation of the audience, both his onstage listeners and the audience members in the theater, that expectation is built into the syntax of Bernardo's speech. We know when and who. We are waiting for the verb in the sentence in the same way that we are waiting for the actions on the stage. The breaking off after the bell then beating one is occasioned by the entrance of the ghost. And Marcellus says, peace, break thee off, look where it comes again. The same kind of experiencing and waiting as action for the spectators takes the form of physical actions in waiting for Godot and becomes a spectacle as we watch repetitive actions not knowing when or how they will end. Vladimir, I knew it was the right place. Now our troubles are over. He picks up the hat, contemplates it, straightens it. Must have been a very fine hat. He puts it on in place of his own, which he hands to Astragon. Here. What? Hold that. Astragon takes Vladimir's hat. Vladimir adjusts Lucky's hat on his head. Astragon puts on Vladimir's hat in place of his own, which he hands to Vladimir. Vladimir takes Astragon's hat. Astragon adjusts Vladimir's hat on his head. Vladimir puts on Astragon's hat in place of Lucky's, which he hands to Astragon. Astragon takes Lucky's hat. Vladimir adjusts Estragon's hat on his head. Estragon puts on Lucky's hat in place of Vladimir's, which he hands to Vladimir. Vladimir takes his hat. Estragon adjusts Lucky's hat on his head. Vladimir puts on his hat in place of Estragon's, which he hands to Estragon. Estragon takes his hat. Vladimir adjusts his hat on his head. Estragon puts on his hat in place of Lucky's, which he hands to Vladimir. Vladimir takes Lucky's hat. Estragon adjusts his hat on his head. Vladimir puts on Lucky's hat in place of his own, which he hands to Estragon. Estragon takes Vladimir's hat. Vladimir adjusts Lucky's hat on his head. Estragon hands Vladimir's hat back to Vladimir, who takes it and hands it back to Estragon, who takes it and hands it back to Vladimir, who takes it and throws it down. How does it fit me? How would I know? <laughs> If we remember the experience in the theater of the unfolding of the action, with delays, sidetracks, interruptions, and the impossibility of fully sharing that experience, we can see some of the ways that drama is always encouraging us to consider drama as a genre. 
in the midst of attending to the individual event or performance. Very near the crisis in the play Hamlet, there is also a comic hat scene. Osric arrives to deliver the invitation from the king for Hamlet to take part in the sword fight with Laertes. As you likely remember, Osric is a bit of a buffoon. Hamlet calls him a waterfly. Hamlet agrees to hear the message from the king, but he twits Osric with, your bonnet to his right use, just for the head. Hamlet and Osric have this exchange, which rehearses the earlier exchanges with Polonius, another obsequious man willing to agree to contrary propositions. I think your lordship it is very hot. No, believe me, it is very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. But yet he thinks it is very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord, it is very sultry, as twere, I cannot tell how. Frequently, productions will increase the taking off and putting on of Osric's hat, even before Hamlet says, I beseech you remember a moment in text that usually has the added stage direction for Hamlet to sign to him to put on his hat. Hamlet's mockery of Osric's fustian elevated diction results in a dialogue driven by Hamlet's questioning of Osric, as Hamlet's directions for Osric's physical actions demonstrate his control over Osric's person. Hamlet has already dismissed his other interrupting obsequious inquisitor with answers that do not answer. Polonius asks in 2-2, what do you read, my lord? And Hamlet responds, words, words, words. This response, words, 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 reverberates because while true, it functions in a different register than the questioner's question. Polonius expects a response about what he calls then the matter, and Hamlet's response offers only the form. In Waiting for Godot, the appearance of the boy raises the possibility that the plot will move forward as a possibility. When Vladimir attempts to engage the boy in a conversation that depends on a shared past, the boy denies the existence of a shared past, yesterday, and answers only within the form of yes sir, no sir answers. Vladimir's response indicates his dismissal of the conversation up to that point. You don't know me? No sir. It wasn't you who came yesterday? No sir. This is your first time. Yes sir. Words, words. Speak. Mr. Gatto told me to tell you he won't come this evening, but surely tomorrow. Vladimir echoes Hamlet's dismissive response to Polonius' question, what do you read, my lord, when Hamlet responds, words, words, words. Hamlet, as a character, has been criticized for not doing, for not taking the action pressed on him by the ghostly version of his father. However, his indecision about the uses of life appear in the play before he knows of the ghostly imperative. At the end of 1-2, after agreeing to stay on at Elsinore, Hamlet wishes, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. His well-known soliloquy in 3-1, overheard by the king and Polonius, has entered into the ling English language in pervasive ways. To be or not to be, that is the question, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. In Waiting for God, though, <clears throat> Vladimir echoes some of the language of this well-known speech. Let us not waste our time in idle discourse. Let us do something while we have the chance. It is not every day that we are needed, not indeed that we personally are needed. Others would meet the case equally well, if not better. To all mankind they were addressed, those cries for help still ringing in our ears. But at this place, at this moment of time, all mankind is us, whether we like it or not. Let us make the most of it before it is too late. Let us represent worthily, for once, the foul brood to which a cruel fate consigned us. What do you say? Estragon says nothing. It is true that when, with folded arms, we weigh the pros and cons, we are no less a credit to our species. The tiger bounds to the help of his congeners without the least reflection, or else he slinks away into the depths of the thickets. But that is not the question. What are we doing here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this, that we happen to know the answer. Yes, in this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Gatto to come. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, I didn't give you the rest of it, did I? Um, <clears throat> There are several interesting things about this moving speech of Vladimir's. 
As a side note, the stage direction, Estragon says nothing, would seem to be superfluous since anyone on stage with the speaker is saying nothing unless the text appears for that character. But I think this stage direction <clears throat> probably means to suggest that Estragon should offer no answer, even physical, to the direct question from Vladimir. Surprisingly, a rather large proportion of this speech depends on very regular IMs. It is not terribly unusual to have a series of IMs, an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, in the midst of a speech. Um, but in the midst of this speech, they offer a preparation for what Vladimir echoes toward the end of the speech. I pulled out a couple of the sections of the speech and scanned them to show the regularity of the meter in this prose. Um, that when with folded arms we weigh the pros and cons. I mean, this is pretty obviously heavily iambic. Um, <clears throat> when we hear the line, what are we doing here, that is the question. It must call to mind Hamlet's blank verse line, to be or not to be, that is the question. Rarely in Waiting for Godot <clears throat> does Beckett employ italics within the dialogue to indicate emphasis. Here, the opening of the line, what are, what are we doing here, uh, maintains the iams of Shakespeare's uh, to be or not to be. Uh, the italics are necessary here for it to be clear that Vladimir departs from the metrical regularity offered by Hamlet's line. In other words, if Beckett has set us up to hear the iams, and presumably for the actor to speak them, he must use the emphasis mark within the text um, or the obvious way of reading the line here would emphasize is. So this is just those two lines next to each other, scanned. Vladimir thus revises Hamlet's question of existence, to be or not to be, into a question of action. What are we doing here? We might consider the critical conversation around Hamlet, the play in the middle of the 20th century, if we want to think about what kinds of questions Beckett might have encountered. C.S. Lewis, in a pamphlet publication of a 1944 lecture that he titled Hamlet, the Prince or the Poem, summarizes that the criticism around the play could be divided into three main schools or tendencies. The first is that which maintains simply that the actions of Hamlet have not been given adequate motives, particularly for his procrastination, and that the play is so far bad. The second school thinks that he did not delay at all, but went to work as quickly as the circumstances permitted. And in the third group or school, school or group, I include all those critics who admit that Hamlet procrastinates and who explain the procrastination by his psychology. Earlier, T.S. Eliot had said in his 1921 essay called Hamlet and His Problems that it was a shame critics were ensnared by the character Hamlet. Few critics have even admitted that Hamlet the play is the primary problem and Hamlet the character only secondary. And Hamlet the character has had an especial temptation for that most dangerous type of critic. This is T.S. Eliot, remember. For that most dangerous type of critic, the critic with a mind which is naturally of the creative order, but which through some weakness in creative power exercises itself in criticism instead. These minds often find in Hamlet a vicarious existence for their own artistic realization. Such a mind had Goethe, who made of Hamlet a Werther, and such had Coleridge, who made of Hamlet a Coleridge. And probably neither of these men in writing about Hamlet remembered that his first business was to study a work of art. And then Hamlet has, or Eliot has a little comment. We should be thankful that Walter Pater did not fix his attention on this play. Eliot continues on in the same essay to remark about Hamlet, the play, so far from being Shakespeare's masterpiece, the play is most certainly an artistic failure. Our own time and other critical commentary has disagreed with Eliot's description of the play. Waiting for Godot offers a theatrical refutation of this commentary by raising the same existential and phenomenological questions as Hamlet, moving them into a 20th century post-war framework. Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, has been widely appreciated, frequently staged, and continuously in print. By bringing to light the conversation it maintains with Hamlet, we may be able to see broader questions about what maintains theater as an important force in meaning making. <clears throat> Returning again to the definition I've proposed, I've added a piece at the end of this definition. 
We might think of drama as a text meant to lead to or evoke a staged event prearranged by actors for presentation in a communal setting with a set of individuals designated as the spectators or audience members to experience a staged event. Our communal experience of the simultaneously mimetic and imaginative possibilities of theater allow us to be in a central place of action through experiencing what we attend to in the drama presented. <clears throat> This might be one way to consider drama as something in our everyday lives to attend to rather than to avoid. Thank you. <clears throat>